please join me in prayer. Father, we want to ascribe to you all of the, the majesty and honor and praise that is due you, uh, but boy, we, we fall short. And so we just want to come before you, uh, bowing the knees of our hearts, lifting our hands before you in full surrender to give you our very best, to acknowledge uh, that not only are you, you worthy, but you are great and glorious beyond all that our minds can think or comprehend. We're thankful for how you sovereignly orchestrate the events of our lives to bring about your purposes. So, Father, I pray for each person here who is joining us online, who's carrying to our time together unspeakably heavy burdens. Father, I pray that you would meet them in their heart, in their hurt, to be the one who, who loves them, who heals them, who comforts them, who gives them direction, who gives them hope. God, we thank you for, for Jesus. Thank you for making us making a way for us to be saved, to be forgiven. God, we're so thankful for, for your word and the light that it gives to us. So we ask for your blessing on our time now, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, several years ago, I went on my very first wilderness trip to Algonquin Provincial Park in Ontario, Canada. Just by way of show of hands, how many of you have gone on a wilderness trip to Algonquin? Let's see those hands. Look at all these folks. Awesome. My very first trip, I'll, I'll never forget some of the dynamics, you know, not really knowing what I was getting into, how this played out, and the, the, the tremendous suffering and hardship that we faced on, on one of these. These trips are, they are, they are endurance contests. And from the very moment that I had to put one of those canoes, hefty canoe, we were using these big, bulky canoes, uh, putting that on your shoulders and feeling the pinch in your, your neck, and it just seemed like it would go on and on and on, mile after mile. And by the time you put that thing down, you were so sore, you just, you just couldn't wait to get to the end. One of the dynamics with that that was very interesting was you knew you were in this beautiful place and you're on this path carrying a canoe because the body not all the bodies of water are connected you're going through the woods on a narrow path and your line of sight your, your visibility is limited basically to this and there's rumors of moose and bears and wolves and that you can't see anything and you're hoping that the person that was supposed to be your partner, your canoe partner, is either right behind you or, or beside you. And suddenly you come upon bear scat, you know, or, or wolf tracks. And let me tell you, when your visibility is this, I mean, even if it's this, that's an eerie feeling. But when it's just this, that can be absolutely terrifying. So what the wilderness was for me in those early days was it helped me to really connect the dots and it cemented for me some life-defining spiritual truths that I will never forget. And it can, those experiences continue to help me to process the things that I go through today. The very first trip, we memorized 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. If you have your Bibles with you, I hope you do. You'll want to be right there. That's where we're going to spend our time. The reason you should, Several reasons you should bring a Bible to church. I know we put the words on the screen, okay, I, I get that, but you want to have that in front of you because that gives you an opportunity to mark your Bible, you can take notes, you can see the context of what's going on in the passage, and you can see God's word for yourself and not just take the screen's word for it. Okay, the very first sentence in that passage is what? Therefore we do not lose heart. Man, at what that was like to be shouldering that, that canoe. And this is just such a momentary affliction. I mean, this is going to pass within, within minutes. I'm going to get to the end of the portage, and I'm going to set that canoe down. But in the midst of it, when you are shouldering that burden, and, and, and you're, you're the only one carrying it, 
I just can remember reciting to myself over and over again, do not lose heart, do not lose heart, do not lose heart, just trying to make it to the end. And life is a lot like that sometimes, isn't it? There was extra incentive actually on that trip for, for memorizing God's word. It was the first time in my life, uh, this is, was when I was a teenager, that I had ever memorized more than just one verse at a time in the Bible. I actually memorized multiple verses strung together in a passage. I didn't even know I could do that. And the incentive was you had to, you had to come to dinner with the verse of the day memorized. I, let me tell you, on one of those trips, food is fuel, and that was some major, like, I was going to eat. So everyone had that verse memorized. It, man, within three days' time, we had this passage. I couldn't forget this passage now if my life depended on it. It is, it is burned onto my soul. So that's where we're going to be. How do we avoid losing heart? That's the question I want to interact with this morning. How do we avoid losing heart, especially when we feel like we're drowning and when the weight of that thing on our shoulders has so restricted our view and, and feels like our knees are buckling underneath the weight, when we're in the midst of, of just dark, oppressive suffering, you know, when the, the kids are out of control and you've burnt the garlic bread and the dog needs to go out and there's spilled orange juice on the, on the carpet, or, or even worse, you've received a cancer diagnosis or someone that you loved has or you lose a loved one? How do we stop our circumstances from sucking our hearts right out of our chest and stomping on them? How, from making us slaves of worry and anxiety and fear and depression? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man or our outer self is perishing or wasting away, at the same time, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day for our light affliction. Can you believe that? Our, our light affliction is but for a moment, but it's working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. For we don't look at the things which are seen, the physical visible, but we look at the things which are not seen, because the things that are not seen are the, the spiritual invisible. So we don't look at the things which are seen, but the things which are, are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporary, they're, they're transient. But the things which are not seen are eternal. And so that's where we want to fix our, our attention. Let's start now with that phrase, we do not lose heart. Okay, here's a strong Greek term. This is where the title of our series came from. Uh, it means to abandon oneself to cowardly surrender. So that's what Paul, the Apostle Paul, is telling us not to do. Don't you dare, in the midst of that hard, no matter how heavy that thing is, don't you dare surrender. Don't you dare buckle. Don't you dare give up. You have every reason in the world not to give up, not to throw in the tile. Stay in the ring. So this statement, is a, it's a thoroughly discouraged, even depressed mindset it's, uh, or internal existence that really we are so vulnerable to when we're going through hard times, right? But this is actually the second time that it shows up in this chapter because Paul uses it back in verse 1. He starts the chapter the very same way. He says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy... There's a motivation for not losing heart. If you reflect on the mercy that you have received from God, therefore we do not lose heart. Okay, so that's a little bit of, of the context there and how Paul uses the phrase. Let's look at some other usages of this phrase throughout the Bible. Okay, we go to Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we will reap a harvest if what? If we do not lose heart. Maybe you just need to hang on just a little bit longer because that harvest is coming. Luke chapter 18, 1, this is Jesus speaking. He told them a parable to the effect that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. 
Look at the, the interaction, the, the, the connected relationship between prayer and not losing heart. John 16, Jesus speaking again. He said, I have said these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. No one gets a free pass here. But take heart. I have overcome the world. And if Jesus says, I have overcome the world, if you know Christ is your Savior, then guess what that makes you? Because you have Jesus within you, that makes you an overcomer. Now, I know you may not think that way, you may not feel that way, and you may not even act that way. But the truth of the matter is, if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you absolutely are an overcomer, and you have every reason in the world to take heart. You cannot be given to cowardly surrender. That's not a part of who you are if you're a child of God. What reason is there, there for optimism? What reason is there to, to take heart when things are not going well at all? We don't see good outcomes on the, on the horizon. What reason do we have for optimism? Verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Let's start with the very first word, therefore. Whenever you see the word therefore in the Bible, you have to ask what it's there for. This is what's so amazing about this word. If you will, therefore gives you a map in the Bible, and you have to trace that, follow its path. God is leading you to treasure if you will just follow the therefores in the Bible. When you do, it, what a thrilling adventure in God's word it puts you on. Just amazing the, the truth here. Nothing will help you take heart like the therefores in the Bible. Okay, so let me show you what I mean. We're going to dig up the treasures of therefore. Okay, and we're going to go back to, to verse 7. And I want to I track with you how this, this therefore applies to this phrase, we do not lose heart, so that you can see all of the reason. It's in just one short chapter that Paul gives us for not losing heart. Back in verse 7, are, are you with me? Uh, we have the treasure of Christ and his gospel and weak bodies so that all the glory goes to God. See, therefore, because of that, we do not lose heart. We are afflicted but not crushed, perplexed but not despairing, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Verse 10, are you with me there? When we carry about in our body the dying of Jesus, the life of Jesus is manifested in our body. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Then verse 15, the verse that leads right into our passage. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. See, therefore, we do not lose heart. Because there's purpose in your suffering. One of these purposes is mentioned in verse 15 here, that God's grace through your suffering would actually extend to more and more people. Do you realize the grace that extends to people through your suffering. We experienced that with John Blank, who we recognized earlier in the service. How does that happen? How, how does God's grace spread to others through your, your suffering? It's through your testimony, how you're processing and messaging your suffering. And are people just seeing a hard time or are they seeing your Savior? So I've actually asked Matt Grammatico. Uh, it's been a little while since we've heard from him. And I wanted you to hear from an individual who has actually lived this passage and has mined these truths. And I thought his perspective, because he has suffered a hundred times greater than I have, um, I thought it would be really valuable for you to hear from him. Good morning. Um, first, I just want to give you a quick update. Uh, my wife and I just came back from Cleveland. Um, um, so I don't know if you know or not, but uh, some of you don't know. Um, a year ago this past January, I received uh, a new heart and a new liver at Cleveland Clinic, uh, double organ transplant. Um, and I was sick for a long time before that, very sick. 
and um, just came back from Cleveland for a checkup uh, this past Monday, and everything looks real good. Uh, so. And uh, so I'm, I just want to share some more good news. I want to thank my wife because on Tuesday we celebrate 25 years of marriage. So I just wanted to share, um, like Pastor Jeff was saying, just a little bit about kind of what I experienced um, before, during, and after my time in the hospital. Um, so um, while I was in the hospital, my body w was crashing, was wasting away. Um, but at the time, I didn't realize that I was being renewed day by day. Um, it wasn't physical, but it was emotional, it was a mental, and most importantly, it was spiritual. Um, that renewing, that renewing was becoming more like Christ. Um, and if you know Jesus as your Savior, um, you can be confident that no matter what you're enduring, what you're suffering through, um, Jesus is not going to forget you. He's not going to leave you as you are. Um, he wants you to be more like him. And um, he wants you to experience the sanctification of becoming more like him. When I was in the hospital, my, my troubles, my illness, did not seem light, and it did not seem momentary. But I needed to keep in mind the difference between my here and now and my there and then. And, and when I say my there and then, I meant I mean my eternity with Jesus. Um, so I had to come to the resolution that, that I couldn't fix me, that I couldn't make things better. There was nothing I could do. Um, God could fix me. God could heal me. But the question was, would he? Would he, would he save me? Would he allow me to continue to live? Um, so what I needed to do is I needed to allow God to just love me his way and take care of me and lead me in the way that he saw fit. Um, however, he chose to do that. Um, but in that, I had to know that my future is, was not in my hands, not up to me. My future was in his hands. Um, and, and what that did was, when I came to terms with that, it gave me the ability to not have any fear or anxiety. Um, even while being wheeled into surgery, I, I can't explain it, but I had no fear. I had no anxiety. I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, but I knew that whatever would happen, that, that God was with me. And I had nothing to fear because I knew who was in control. So my life is not my own. Um, it belongs to my Savior. My future is eternal. Um, I don't know where my future is going to be, how it's going to go. Um, but I do know where it's going to end up. My future is going to end up with me being in my Savior's arms one day. Amen. Okay, so I just want to encourage you those out there, um, no matter what you're going through, uh, no matter what you're enduring, like Pastor Jeff says, don't give up. Don't give up. Just continue to just focus on the fact that he loves you, and his love may not look the way you think it should look. It may not appear to be, you may, it may not feel like he's loving you, but he is, and he does. I want to ask you a question. So, understanding that when you were wheeled away, and, and Rhonda couldn't be there because of COVID rules and all, I mean, unbelievable. You didn't know if you were going to wake up. Right. What was it like when you woke up in that hospital bed? <laughs> My family still asks about that. Um, <laughs> so understanding, I was, I was a little drugged, too. But um, uh, Maybe I, should I, I annoyed, <laughs> let's, just say, let's just say I annoyed the daylights out of my nurses for about 48 hours because I just kept praising the Lord over and over out loud. And every nurse that walked in my room, I'm like, do you know Jesus? If you don't, you need to. And uh, they... Uh, <laughs> I was, I was just, I think what it was was just thankfulness and gratitude um, just to know that, you know, I, I, was, I was still around. And um, 
uh, I just wanted others to recognize what I already, what I knew, what I was totally convinced of, you know, mm -hmm. that, that God can do anything he wants to do, and it's not up to me. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted others around me to know that. And um, the, the response is very interesting. When you, when you see a group of people, and each response is quite interesting, when you continue to tell them over and over again, <laughs> do you know Jesus? If you don't, you should. And then, and, uh, so, but anyways, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> you know, was, Thank you. Appreciate yep. that, man. See, God's grace extends to more and more through, through our testimony, through the, your testimony in the midst of suffering. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, and that applies to every single one of us. The moment you were born, you began the process of dying. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. Okay, now Paul introduces another even though circumstance, okay, where he says even though our outer self is, is wasting away, there's a bigger reality at play here. But let's go back to some of the even those that set us up for the biggest even though. Okay, if you look back in the, in the text, he says even though we are afflicted, we are not crushed. So take heart. Even though we are perplexed, we are not in despair. So take heart. Even though we are persecuted, we are not forsaken. So take heart. Even though we are struck down, we are not destroyed. So take heart. See, verse 16 tells us that even though our bodies are wasting away, our souls are being renewed. So we can take heart. So this wasting away or perishing of the flesh is Paul referring to our aging bodies. Now, I know, young people, you may not think that this applies to you just yet, but you gotta, you got to hang with me here because you're experiencing more wasting away than you know. Okay? <laughs> Paul is not only aging, but he's feeling the effects of being brutalized. Look, guys, this wasting away can come upon you in a moment. See, when, when you're young, you, you, you are in, you're building your body, maybe up until about the, the age of, of 30 or so. I, I don't know. Um, that's a very, fir very short period of time. Your first 30 years at best, maybe. But as you get older, you begin to fight this deconstruction process. You, you're losing your vision, your hearing, your hair. You become more stiff, more easily injured. You can't do the things you once did. You have to take pills to help you fight the effects of wasting away. The wasting away can also come upon you suddenly. One thing that every single one of us in this room and viewing online that we all have in common is we are all engaged in this process of wasting away. It's a, it's a huge suffering. It's a huge trial. But here's the reality that we see in the passage this morning. Even though, even though we are wasting away, the reality is this, our circumstances are not determinative. Just because you're wasting away physically doesn't mean you have to waste away spiritually. Doesn't mean your faith has to waste away. Just because the outcome for you physically is bleak doesn't mean that your faith has to turn bleak. See, your external circumstances do not determine the internal condition of your heart. That's what I mean by our circumstances are not determinative. So maybe right now you're giving your circumstances, the externals, more power over you than they ought to have. Okay? Is, is the one thing that's bothering your soul right now made bigger and holding more power over you because of your response to it? See, God never intends for your circumstances to hold sway over you. They don't dictate the love that God sheds abroad in your heart and that comes out in your life, even though you may be suffering. Your circumstances don't require you to wallow in worry and sorrow. Your inner self, your soul, your heart, it can be renewed day by day, even though your body is breaking down, because then your faith can be strengthened, even though you have doubts about the outcome of, of your job, your marriage, your kids. See, your body may be growing weaker and weaker and more frail, but your soul can actually be growing stronger in the context of that suffering. Just because your circumstances are bleak does not mean that your faith has to be. 
Okay, so how are we going to take heart in the midst of soul-draining circumstances? Here we go. Number one, you've got to renew your mind. This is where the text starts. Be sure you see the word renewed in verse 16. Vitally important word. We do not lose heart, though. Our outer self is wasting away. The inner self is being renewed day by day. Renew means something ran out. The bucket leaks. The car runs out of gas. The spiritual metabolism of your life can only be sustained by feeding on biblical truth. You and I have got to have daily nourishment day after day. There is not a day that goes by that you do not take in physical nourishment because food is fuel. It keeps you going. Without it, you would gradually deteriorate and shut down. And it's no wonder that so many lose heart because they make no investment in renewing the inner man day by day. We feed our bodies, which are wasting away. We put gas in our cars. We keep the oil changed. Our cars are all wasting away, especially here in western New York. We go to the doctor. We take our medicine. We care for our bodies. They're wasting away. Yet, we make no provision for the inner man that just as much, if not more so, has to be renewed day by day. Physical renewal happens when you eat, drink, sleep, you're kept warm. See, if you're going to take heart in the midst of adversity, the adversity that you're facing today, the only way to do so is to consume the Word of God. It's interesting how Jesus addresses all of those needs that we have for, for physical life. He addresses them with, with His Word. Um, in John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Psalm 42, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. So he quenches our, our spiritual thirst. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See, all of the things that you need for physical survival, God transposes those into the spiritual realm and says, Look at I've given you all of those things, and they're all accessible to you through the resource of my word. Now, look at, uh, look at Psalm 119 here, verse 107 where David says, I am afflicted very much. Okay, he gives us the context. Great affliction. And what's his prayer? He knows what he needs. He knows the only way through this. He says, revive me, O Lord. How? How is he going to be revived? According to your word. Look back at verse 71, where David says, it is good for me that I have been afflicted. How can he say that? Because he's learned that in the context of that, he learns God's word in more dramatic fashion than any other way. See, God grows us, he matures us through a thousand battles throughout life and a thousand renewals over the course of time so that we never, ever forget that we are weak and he is strong, that he's our strength, he's our living water, He's our food, he's our gas, he's our medicine, however you want to put that. Now, how does God's word bring that spiritual renewal? Okay, what is it about the Bible that's so powerful that it can do what nothing else can in the midst of, of hardship, especially when we're afflicted? Okay, Paul uses this word renew several other places. I want to look at just one, Colossians chapter 3, verse 9, key. He says, uh, you have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of the Creator. So the, the clue is the phrase, in knowledge. In knowledge of what? The image of the Creator. See, our, our inner selves, our new, regenerate, Christ-trusting selves, when you have, have made Christ your Savior, are being renewed in knowledge. So being renewed day by day comes through what we put into our heads. See, God has designed the glory of us as, as human beings such that the condition of our hearts is profoundly impacted, profoundly influenced by the, the content of our heads or by what our mind consciously focuses on. So the condition of your heart is determined by the content of your head. How does Paul says that we're renewed? We're renewed in knowledge. In knowledge of what? All of the realities and glories of our Creator. 
think with me for just a, just just think. Do, do you know of any Christian who is being renewed day by day, who is able to take heart in the midst of affliction without putting biblical truth into their heads? Do you know anybody? It's not even humanly possible. See, not losing heart is profoundly connected to not losing truth. If you're going to take heart, you have to input truth. So fresh strength is found profoundly connected to fresh knowledge being put into your head. Okay, what do we need if we're going to take heart now? Well, we have to renew our minds. Number two, in the passage, we've got to look to the unseen eternal. We see this in verses 17 and 18. Again, language is important here. We've got to look at the, the first word um, where it, it says, for this, okay, for this light momentary affliction, this, this word for, or it can be translated because. So here he's setting us up for another reason not to lose heart. So the, the main support in this paragraph for our daily renewal comes from verse 17. And, and what follows because? We do not lose heart. Why? Because of this truth. This light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all, com all comparison. Then we go to, to verse 18. 18 emphasizes, hey, you've got to look at this. This thing that's not seen, look at that. Look at these future unseen glorious things. Think about them. Set your mind on them. Meditate on them. Memorize them. Recite them. Preach them to yourself. Look, look, look. Look at the invisible spiritual. Okay, that's the point of verse 18, that the basis of, of your day-by-day -day renewal and you're not losing heart is actually unseen and eternal. Because the fall, your fallen nature, fallen humanity oppresses you and it causes, it exacerbates, it magnifies your wasting away. And those things are painfully visible for all of us. So you cannot focus on them. If you do, you will be filled with, with despair. If you focus on only that which can be seen, the physical visible. No, you have to look on the unseen. You have to look on the, uh, the, the eternal. It's just like carrying a canoe for, in life. If you just focus on the adversity, you focus on the, the pinch in your shoulders and only what you can see before you, your, your view is so limited and, and you're stuck. You don't ever get to see the unseen realities, how far you've come and, and where you're going, what the ultimate destination is. So what's the promise? What is this unseen reason that we need to put into our heads for the sake of our hearts so that we'll be renewed day by day? Here's, here's the answer. Okay, it's the promise that all of your affliction, the hard that you're facing right now, even if it lasts a lifetime, which, by the way, it did for the guy who wrote this, the Apostle Paul, no season of rest, no such thing as retirement, no reward for his suffering at the end of his life, Remember, he was executed by Nero, cut short. The hard that you're facing right now, no matter what it is, nobody's exempt, is light and momentary and totally meaningful. Wow. So we do not lose heart. See, suffering always seems long and heavy. Even the canoe on the, the portage trail, when is this going to end? And I just want to quit and drop the thing. Give up. Let the person behind me carry it. Paul says, no, you've got to have your focus on eternity. Only then, when your focus is on, on the unseen, eternal, only then will your temporary nature of your hardship become visible. And I'm not minimizing anything that you're going through. I know we have, uh, some of you are going through unspeakably hard times. I'm just trying to bring light to the perspective that the text offers us. Because even a lifetime of affliction is light. Okay, remember, this is the Apostle Paul talking. This is not Jeff Bartz. Okay, this guy had really suffered. Okay, now you got to notice the contrast here. Okay, this, I, I love how Scripture does this. Okay, let's start with this word momentary. You see how it's, it's the opposite of eternal. Okay, this is why you got to mark your Bible so that you can see these things because God is, is, is painting a picture for us. And then between light and weight. And then between affliction and glory. 
There seems to be nothing glorious about affliction, right? But he wants to draw these contrasts for, for a purpose here. Okay, this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal, contrasting with momentary, weight, contrasting with light, of glory. See, if we focus on the things that are seen, whatever you're going through is not going to seem light. It's going to seem heavy and bigger than it really is. It's going to see, it's not going to, it's not going to seem momentary or temporary. And you're going to question whether or not it will ever end. We look to the things that are unseen. What's the unseen in the, in the text? The eternal weight of glory that is beyond all comparison. Okay, so now, what do we need to do if we're going to take heart? We have to renew our mind. We have to focus on the unseen eternal. Okay, here's, here's another key. We have to focus on God's purpose, and he gives us his purpose. It doesn't matter what your suffering is. This is one of God's written, recorded purposes for, for your suffering. Okay, there is a, a bridge between this light momentary affliction, the physical visible, and the eternal weight of glory, the invisible spiritual. Okay, and they are connected by this verb. The verb is preparing. Okay, is preparing. It means uh, to produce, to cause, to uh, bring about an effect. Uh, that means that this affliction, no matter what your affliction is, is bringing about glory. And the weight of it, how big it is, how much, how heavy it is, is actually impacted by the nature of your affliction. So this affliction that you have, uh, you may be wasting away, and it's not just intended to have an effect here and now, causing you to rely on God, bringing you to repentance, helping you to pursue righteousness. It, it should and ought, we ought to let it accomplish those things in our life. But it's also having an, an eternal effect. And that's that glory and, and that eternal weightiness and significance is increasing because of your, your affliction. Okay, this is a real mind shift when it comes to affliction because when I see someone suffering a hundred times greater than me, a, a John Blank or a, a Matt, Keld, uh, Matt Gramatico, Paul is calling it light and momentary. And so I want to be able to say to a guy like that, wow, what God, is, God is really doing something in your life. He's really working something here. What you're going through is, is not meaningless. I mean, I don't know what this is all about. I don't, I, don't, I don't know all the purposes, but this is really preparing something weighty and glorious for you. That God is making up for you what you have suffered here. See, none of us are the same in our afflictions and certainly in our response to our afflictions. We don't respond in the same way. So the weight of this glory is going to differ for each of us in heaven. Okay, so here's, here's the principle. What you will be endowed with will be determined by what you endured. What you are endowed with will be determined by what you endured. Okay, there's meaning and purpose in your affliction. But if your affliction and adversity is taking you further from Christ... That ought to be a warning to you. You need intervention now if that's the case. That is a spiritual warning that you may actually be traversing suffering without a savor, and that is the worst of spiritual situations. See, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, and you find yourself in the midst of hardship right now, the weightiness, the glory cannot increase because you have nothing recorded in heaven to increase. Your name is not written in the book of life. The record of your name cannot increase and continue to grow in weight because of your affliction. Your affliction is wasted if you do not know Christ as your Savior. So if you'll turn to Christ to save you from your sin... You can have purpose. You can experience purpose in your suffering. And you will see how your suffering is meant to bring about for you a weight of glory beyond all comparison. Okay, look what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. He says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And this glory, which God will someday show us and give us, is beyond imagination. Look at how he describes it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 
what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. And more than that, that there are special glories in the age to come brought about by your particular afflictions. That's what verse 17 says, that your affliction is preparing or producing for you an eternal weight of glory that is growing in correspondence with your, with your affliction beyond all comparison. That's what I mean by saying that every moment of your affliction is meaningful. It has meaning. It is doing something. It is working something. It is causing something. It's bringing about something glorious. And you cannot see this. The world can't see this. They think, and you may be tempted to think, that suffering is meaningless, that it's not doing anything good. I can't see anything good coming out of this. And that's what you feel if you focus on the scene. To which Paul then responds, no, you look at the things which are not seen, the promise of God that there is purpose, that nothing in your pain is meaningless. It's all preparing, it's all working, it's producing something, a weight of glory, a special glory of you, just because of that pain. 2 Corinthians 4, therefore we do not lose heart. Even though the outer self is perishing, is wasting away, yet the inward self is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. For we do not look at the things which are seen, no, but the things which are not seen, because the things that are seen are temporary, they are transient, they are passing away. But we look at the things that are not seen. We have to renew our minds. Look to the unseen eternal. Focus on God's promises that there is great purpose in your pain. Father, that's what we want to do right now is to be able to see your purpose. We know oftentimes this is invisible to us. It's hidden from us. And boy, we really have to, we've got to go on that treasure hunt. We've got to follow the therefores on the Bible. We have to reflect deeply on your promises to be able to see the purpose in our pain. God, for everyone who is hurting here this morning, God, I pray that you would, you would lead them, you would draw them to that place. Thank you for all of the treasures that we have in Christ. And I pray that if there's anyone watching, if there's anyone here this morning, who has not experienced the riches that we have in you because they don't yet know Christ as their Savior. God, I pray that you would turn their heart to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And we exist to do just that, to be able to, to meet you right where you are, in your pain, in your heart, and to bring the truth of God's word that can only bring renewal and revival to your soul. So if there's any way that we can help you in that journey, that's what we want to do. You can contact us a variety of ways. You can certainly do it online through any of our venues there. You can grab me or one of the other pastors in person afterward. You can call the church throughout the week, send us an email, a text message. We would love to be able to join you in this journey. Thanks for joining us this morning. You're dismissed.